Hello my friends and welcome back. It's Monday, so happy Monday to you. So many things happened throughout the week and it was so hard for me to relax because I kept getting beautiful notifications from Ukraine doing something insane again to the Russian rear areas or there was some kind of an attack in a Russian prison that I cannot even talk about. But we'll start with half a Russian battalion that got surrounded in Vovjansk. Yeah, I'm not kidding you. In this war, not many surroundings happen because both sides don't move that fast. Like the German Blitzkrieg, what they did with their panzers where they moved like 25 kilometers in a day behind the enemy rear, surrounding one million men, that doesn't happen anymore. Both sides move very slowly. But in this case, we truly have 400 Russian soldiers, which is about half of their battalion, surrounded in north of Kharkiv, Vovjansk city. Now you can see it right here. I'll zoom out. You can see this Russian occupied or controlled salient in the settlement. And if we zoom in, this highway right here to the right of this highway from your look is an aggregate factory. All of this area here is an aggregate factory. And this highway actually is controlled now by the Ukrainians. It has been cut off. This map doesn't show it, but that has been the reality for the last two days. And we know the body count in this factory of the Russians. It is half a battalion. Half a battalion. This is one of the biggest surroundments in this war at all, period. Since not many surroundments happen in this war. Many Russian soldiers from this surrounded factory have already surrendered. There are a lot of wounded and they're running out of food and water and ammunition. Much like the Azovstal for the Ukrainians, this is also a factory, but now it's the Russians in the factory. Russians have made many attempts to free or liberate their guys, get them back by attacking across this highway, but Ukrainians have been able to defend and push them back, keeping these Russians in a cauldron, as you can say. Time will tell if they will be destroyed, if they will surrender, or if Russians will actually pull the guys back by striking across this highway and liberating the, f reoccupying the factory area. But as of now, the situation remains incredibly dense, and it is one of the first and so big surroundments of this war. I'm very excited about this situation. Ukrainians are bombarding every building of this factory. There are 22 buildings altogether combined in this area and Ukrainians are bombarding every last one of them to level it to the ground because it is 400 less occupiers in their land. When scanning telegram channels for intel about battles in Ukraine, sometimes some info comes from very sketchy websites that definitely are stealing some info about me. This is why I use Private Internet Access VPN. Browsing the internet with an unencrypted connection is like sending private message to a group chat. Everyone saw your terrible meme. A virtual private network, or a VPN for short, is an app that hides your IP address and safeguards your internet internet connection through an encrypted tunnel. Whenever you connect to the internet on a public Wi-Fi network at airports, coffee shops, friends' houses, or even at your own home, your data is at risk of being stolen. Pia VPN keeps you protected against such threats. That's not all. Pia VPN allows you to access foreign restricted content from all over the world. It helps you overcome these restrictions by giving you the option to change your IP address to one of 91 countries to choose from. What's even better, private internet access allows you to protect an unlimited amount of devices at the same time. Pia VPN has become an indispensable tool for me in my work, keeping my connections secure while traveling and opening access to various sources of information that are so important for my work. Now you can get a full protection and all the other features for an amazing price. By using my link, piavpn.com slash arturrehi, you can grab an 83% discount on private internet access. That's just $2.03 a month, and you also get four extra months completely for free. Now, my friends, I'll bring you a report translated by Dimitri. 
to you. It is about Russian units in the Kherson region, so southern Ukraine, and it is about alcohol. Of course it is. Russian report from the front line, it gotta be alcohol. Turns out that there is a huge drinking problem. I read through the whole report and I made a summarization for you to save time. The, one of the unit commanders describes the situation that in their unit, many times, drunk soldiers have opened fire on their own units. Now imagine, yours. look, Russians don't drink a few beers, they drink wasted, blackout drunk. And in that delirium state, you might wake up in the middle of the night, you don't know where you are, you have drinking a whole liter of vodka. Yeah, you heard correctly, whole liter, no problem for them. And they just see movement, they open fire, forgetting that they are in their own positions, opening fire on their own troops. Has happened more than once. This is a report from their own troops who complain that this is getting out of hand, drinking and shooting at their own men. Or another instance when one drunk soldier got in a half a company killed. Half a company, that's a lot of troops. And of course, in war, the company and the unit and the squad and every kind of unit of soldiers is as strong as the weakest link, as it is with any kind of working together or a group or a chain. So this drunk soldier was the weakest link. He was slow, he was loud, and he didn't know where to go. Perhaps he stepped on a mine or opened fire in the wrong area. Perhaps they were assaulting at night and he was loud at the wrong place. And Ukrainians heard him ordering fire missions entire half company got killed. He then rants about the lack of care men have when they are drunk. Almost no one can stop at 100 grams, that's a quote, 100 grams of vodka or strong alcohol, meaning that yes, if you go on an assault, you need that 100 grams, it gives you courage. But what he means that almost nobody can stop is, you're supposed to stop at 100. But they take 100, then they get drunk and they drink an entire bottle and then they are not soldiers anymore, the useless pieces of meat. And he ends with the description of how his unit buys hundreds of liters of alcohol per day. There are hustlers near the front lines who make money for it, who push hundreds of liters, truckloads of alcohol to the Russian units. Now, we couldn't tell if these are pro-Russian or pro-Ukrainian people. Perhaps they're just pro-capitalist people who want to make money. But the truth and the ending fact is that Russian units buy hundreds of liters every day. And there's a whole logistical chain worked up to keep these Russian units supplied with alcohol daily. My friends, 15th to 16th of June, so this weekend they just ended in Switzerland there was a Ukraine peace summit. This is not just another diplomatic gathering of Ukrainian supporters. This was the biggest peace summit and gathering of Ukrainian supporters ever since the start of this war in the last 10 years. Almost every country in the first world or the collective West took part of that peace summit and Russia played for the fact that nobody wants to take part. Ukraine cannot organize this. Countries are not interested. They are tired. They are fatigued. This was not true. Everyone was present, leaders, prime ministers, presidents, kings, even monarchies were present and Russia was not invited. Now I will read you the biggest quotes, the most important quotes from that peace summit. Of course, every country has their own understanding and their own agenda to push, but the collective understanding of the summit is pro-Ukraine and supportive of Ukrainian territorial integrity, which means if there would be peace with Russia, most countries think that there would be dialogue with Russia, but one of the conditions is that Ukrainian territorial integrity must be respected, meaning Russia will pull out of Crimea and all the occupied Ukraine areas. United States. Yesterday, Putin put forward proposals to resolve the Russia-Ukrainian conflict, but he's not talking about negotiations. He's talking about the surrender of Ukraine. Yes, because a few days, actually one day before this peace summit happened, Putin started panicking, suddenly started to be frightened, and came out publicly, officially, on cameras with his own peace proposals. This only means that he saw the huge potential attendance of this peace conference in Switzerland, and he wanted to get one up on them all and propose his own peace. And you know what his peace, you know, his fixing of this conflict means? He said, we will start a ceasefire 
when Ukraine pulls out of four oblasts, Luhansk, Donetsk, uh, Kherson, and Zaporizhia area. So basically the four annexed oblasts that Russia or Putin stole from Ukraine, peace in his eyes is if Ukraine leaves those oblasts entirely with their armies, then Russia will stop this war. This is not peace. This is blackmail. This is pure terrorism, land grab, annexation, and colonialism. And this is what the Switzerland Peace Summit also proved, because most world power, economic and military, was present. 75% of the entire world's power of economic and military was represented in that Switzerland Peace Summit. And the collective argument there was that Ukrainian territorial integrity must be respected. This is what most of the world thinks about this war. Saudi Arabia. Any serious negotiation process requires the presence of Russia. European Council. Peace between Russia, Ukraine and Russia requires a dialogue between the parties. But it is up to Kiev to decide when it can be started. Poland. Russia remains a colonial empire that never went through the path of decolonization that could not deal with the demons of its past. Italy. Mr. Zelensky, come to Italy. We are ready to send a new package of military aid to Ukraine. Moldova. Peace in Ukraine is peace in Moldova. Estonia. Russia is a colonial state. For almost half a century until 1990, Estonia was part of the colonial system of Russia. Germany. It is not enough to stop the war. It is important not to allow the conflict to freeze, leaving the risk of continued aggression. Great Britain, Ukraine did not ask for this war, but Ukrainians are impressive in defending their state. European Commission, freezing the war of the Russian Federation against Ukraine is not the answer, but only a recipe for future wars. Japan, today it is Ukraine, and tomorrow it could be East Asia. Now, throughout all of these communications, we can see that countries are knowingly argumenting against Putin's weapons. Putin's weapons, let's say, freezing the conflict is one of his most effective weapons. This is what happened in Ukraine 2014 to 2022. It was a frozen conflict that stops country from evolving, progressing. Now, most countries in here see this as a weapon already and fight against it. It was a successful peace summit and proves to Putin that his gambles have failed and his time is running out. And now, my friends, I'm going to watch a two-minute speech from Estonian Prime Minister Kaja Gallas from the Switzerland peace summit. And I just want to share the entire speech with you. Principles such as sovereignty, territorial integrity, uh, discrediting aggression as a tool of statecraft are the most important elements. Uh, they must uh, at all costs be preserved. Hence, it is critical that these principles are also upheld in case of Ukraine. That is why I'm concerned uh, to hear about the so-called peace plans or initiatives that don't even mention these principles. Uh, these are the core principles of the UN Charter, the principles that form the basis for secur securing peace globally. We should be very careful not to leave an impression that some uh, topics and principles, such as especially Ukraine's territorial integrity, are somehow uh, secondary to others. They clearly are not. Uh, upholding these principles is the most important way towards a just and lasting peace. They must be at the core of any future peace framework. The Russian war of aggression against Ukraine has lasted for 10 years. For the bigger part of it, the world has ignored it. Uh, there was hope back then, and some are also hoping now, that territorial concessions to the aggressor would bring peace. History has proved that giving up territory for peace has too often led and will le lead to further aggressions. To I will stop that speech now, but I agree with every word. Peace with Russia is not about um, diplomacy anymore. Diplomacy ended when the first man died in Ukraine for Russian bombardment. The only way, and this is what I believe, the only way to ensure peace with Russia is, I can bring an example of Turkey, for example. Russian airplane violated Turkish airspace and it was shot down in 17 seconds. 
The only way to ensure peace with Russia is to defeat them with military power, with brute force in Ukraine. That is the only way. They understand that language and they respect that language. This is what they speak, so this is what we must speak. Last week there was huge shenanigans in the Russian economics and I enjoyed that situation so much. I should have had more popcorn. Of course, the United States slapped a huge packet of sandwich sanctions on Russian economy and for the first time the Moscow Stock Exchange was fully sanctioned and they decided to stop all trading of dollar and euro. And that started a turmoil in the Russian banking system and the economy. And it continues this week also. And this is one of my favorite topics right now. Hashtag Russian ruble is burning. <laughs> Russian government just raised taxes to make up for huge budget deficits. Putin's biggest uh, fear is to show information. He's hiding all statistics, all information, especially Rostat. The statistics of Russia is nitpicking statistics to show for the Western analysis that, oh, the country is not doing that bad. But we can actually see how the country is doing by seeing how much they raise taxes. Because your taxes raising is unpopular as hell in every country. So you raise taxes only if you are in huge trouble, if you're running a huge deficit, meaning you're lacking money in tens of billions, basically. And Russia expects the tax changes to generate about 29 billion in additional budget revenues in 2025. This signals to us, this is how to read the Russian information, signals to us that Russia is running a deficit of close to 30 billion USD in 2024, which is a mind-boggling amount of money for Russia. It's nothing for the United States, but a death blow for Russia. To accomplish this, the corporate income tax rate will increase from 20% to 25%, which is a huge increase. Estonia is also raising taxes. My own country, we are also running a deficit. This is a, it's, it's tough time in the economics. We are at the borderlands of the European Union. Our main trading partner before the war, um, Belarus and Russia, for example, with uh, building materials, construction materials, all of that is stopped now. Everything we export and import has to go through long routes throughout the Central Europe. We're not doing that great. We are raising taxes, but we're talking about 0.5%, maybe at the extreme 1% of some tax. We're introducing a sugar tax. But Russia, 5% of the corporate in income tax and the highest corporate tax rate will rise from 15 to 22, which is 7%. Two different taxes, 5% and 7% raise. This is unprecedented. It is insane. It will impoverish Russian people and businesses. And it is a very short term solution. It's like duct tape to fix a tank. You might attach something with it, but it will fall down in the next bump. It's a very short-term solution for the burning of Russian economy. And to continue with the Russian economic shenanigans, such a nice topic, I love it so much. Banks in Russia face yuan shortage. Yes, <laughs> you heard correctly. Not euro shortage or dollar shortage, because that is truth from the last week already. Now they face yuan shortage, the Chinese currency, after dollar and euro trading halted. Sanctions against Moscow exchange have halted trading in the dollar and euro, leading to a shortage of yuan for Russian banks. Banks turned to the central bank for a record of 14.23 billion yuan in loans, and the central bank increased limits on swap transactions to 20 billion yuan a day. Because of sanctions, market participants fear yuan trading could also come to a halt, making any international payments more difficult. The thing is, any respectable Russian business or a person, individual who respects their wealth, wants to get away from ruble. Whatever they hold in ruble, they want to get away from it as fast as possible. It's like this game burning hot potato. You just want to get... It's losing value. It is burning. You know it's going down in the next year. Whatever you have, it's not going up. You're only losing it faster. So you cannot push it to euro. You cannot push it to dollar. Now you have yuan, at least the Chinese currency, which is set by the Chinese Communist Party. So it has some stability when compared to ruble, at least. So they want to all trade for yuan now, which 
after leading the dollar and euro deficit in Russia, now leads to yuan deficits in Russia, which is crazy, which shows us how Russian people and Russian businesses feel about their own currency. They don't trust it anymore. They want to get rid of it. It's burning in their hands. And an economy is as strong as its people, its participants, the businesses. A currency is as strong as the people and businesses believing in it and placing their trust in it and holding money, like their wealth in this currency. Nobody wants the ruble, even in Russia anymore. And this signals the free fall of it. The Russian central bank might artificially hold it up, but their might will be running out if all of the dollar, euro and yuan has been traded for ruble to keep it strong. And then it suddenly collapses. This is my prediction. Ever since the very slow but steady arrival of the United States, new aid, European new aid, the Czech-led initiative shells that has, have started to arrive in Ukraine, Russian advantage in artillery at the front decreased to 5 to 1. It was 10 to 1. So for every 10 shots Russia was able to fire, Ukraine could only fire one. Now it's 5 to 1. And this is 100% increase for Ukrainians. Of course, there will never be this war where Ukraine actually has artillery advantage. It is just not possible with Russia. But it doesn't have to be like that because Ukrainian artillery makes up for the disadvantage with accuracy. And 5 to 1 is already a very good position to be. And more and more aid is arriving now. And by August, there will be F-16s in Ukraine and a lot more artillery shells and aid than now. Call me an optimist, but the situation is improving. I want to watch the footage with you, my friends. Many people say this is the war of drones and drones fighting drones. And everybody thinks the movie Terminator where lasers are fired and these skeleton robots are walking on the earth. No, this footage shows you what drone versus drone warfare is all about. It's already here and this is the first signs of it. This is a Russian reconnaissance drone. These are very bad boys because they guide Russian FPVs, they guide Russian artillery, and this kills Ukrainian soldiers. So taking out these bad boys is very important. And this is what Ukraine is doing. Look at it. This is an FPV drone flying into a Russian reconnaissance drone. Drones versus drones, robots versus robots, whatever you want to call it. The future is now, my friends. It is locating, trying to get closer. They fly quite slow and now connecting to the target but a beam it goes down i can tell you this recon drone is much more expensive than the kamikaze drone and my friends if you thought this is crazy well look at this footage a kamikaze drone flying seeing a low-flying chopper of course this kamikaze was not made to take down this chopper it probably just wanted to go to the enemy positions and locate some soldiers or ammunition dumps but it finds a chopper of course, it's going to focus after it. Cannot catch it. Chopper is faster. But if it could, it could take it down. This would be one of the first kamikaze drone kills to a chopper. Now, these kamikaze drones are so much worse than you would think. They can take down your recon drones, your choppers. Hell, I can even imagine it, the air is so saturated with them. If a Su-25 of the Russian Air Force flies very slow and low, to evade a radar detection and one kamikaze drone is at the wrong position it flies with the engine through it it can even take down an su-25 now a little bit of shenanigans from romania romania i really love this bravo romania romania refused to issue visas to the entire russian delegation to the oska parliamentary assembly the oska pa session will be held in bucharest from june 29th to july 3rd and of course russia is a member of oska it's a very important european organization security organization of entire europe don't ask me why russia is a member of it i don't have these answers but the fact that romania is like screw you we're not gonna let diplomats in Beautiful. More countries should follow suit, especially Olympics in France should definitely not allow any Russian uh, sportsman to take part of it. Now, my friends, I want to talk to you a little bit about Russian propaganda. Vlad Wexler is really good at this topic and he al we always discuss this when we have a call. He knows about it so much. I have learned so much from him about Russian propaganda. But now more information has come out. What Russians do is that they flood any kind of information space with so many different narratives than possible. 
They don't have one specific truth. That is the peculiarity of Russian propaganda. They don't have the central truth. They flood it with so many different truths, with so many different angles, that whoever consumes this information is left confused in such a state that they don't, they don't believe in anything anymore because they know nothing is true because everybody's lying. That is the fundamental belief. Everybody's lying. And if a person or a society believes that everybody is lying, quite easy to push them in some certain direction, for example, to be part of your meat waves, zombie attacks, because they don't think anymore, they don't question truth anymore, because they've been taught not to think, everything is not true, everybody's lying, don't even try to make up this one certain way of thinking. That is the Russian economy, that is the Russian society, and that is the Russian propaganda machine. Russia is running a program flooding the newsrooms of 800 mainstream news outlets with fake stories and narratives to overload verification process. Yes, this makes verification of truth very difficult, but it also pushes people away from the real truth because they see so much different information coming their way. It confuses them and makes them lose faith in a certain narrative. Unfortunately, I have to admit, this is very effective. Russian propaganda is quite effective in the West and in Russia. And psychologically, they have really worked out how it, how it works, how, what is more effective. And I cannot bash on them here because the West is unfortunately at the moment losing that f on that front. Because sometimes they don't even know that they are at war with Russia. And Russia already weaponizes information against countries that think they're safe in Central Europe and nothing is harming them. But in their own country, information is used as a weapon against them. So in this sense, the West has a lot to learn. My friends, now for the first time of this week, I'll be butchering some buy me a coffee monthly members. Now there's a difference between a supporter and a member there. I cannot change that. That's the system of buy me a coffee. So you gotta become a member and I'll be butchering your name. But first somebody from outside of buy me a coffee, this guy just wrote to me directly and asked the butcher. So Sean Delane, thank you for supporting the channel. Did it through PayPal. But now, I'll be taking some names from the list of buy me a coffee. Stephen Parsons, James Hull, Kevin Patrick Mora, Pontus, Andres Pius. That's gotta be an Estonian name. It is Andres Pius. Estonian guy. Hey, nice. Adam Frax, Robert Thomas, Daniel Turner, Richard Spruill. Thank you to all of these people, my friends. And if you like the channel, you know what to do. Also, I encourage you to go and check out Rehi Podcast because today, this day, already when you watch this video, the episode is out. Finnish Nathan Fellan analysis, Joni Askola, will be uploaded his episode. He came to Estonia, we did a podcast. He's an amazing analysis. Go and watch the podcast. I'll upload every Monday, come hell or high water. Until my next video, my friends, which will be on Wednesday, actually, after tomorrow. Slava Ukrainia and bye-bye.